I'm Bill Jarrett. I'm a uh, physician assistant with Hugh Chatham Neurology, uh, affiliated with uh, Hugh Chatham Memorial Hospital. Um, I function as the APP in the Compass program. This is Sarah Day. She's a registered nurse at Hugh Chatham Memorial Hospital. She's the uh, PAC in the program. And Andrew Tate is uh, uh, director of rehab and home health, both inpatient and outpatient with Hugh Chatham Memorial Hospital. Um, we, want, we would like to share some of the successes that we've had with Compass and our experiences with it. Um, initially, we had some scheduling problems because we uh, kind of a small clinic, general neurology clinic, we don't only see strokes. Uh, so we had to do some uh, changes to our schedule. We started with two days a week. It left us with a good bit of downtime. Now we're only doing one day a week, one afternoon a week, and we can squeeze everybody in. Um, we even sprinkle in some follow-up patients that are not related to Compass to fill up the schedule. And that works for us. So some, some other hospitals and some other uh, clinics might find that useful. Um, one of the benefits that we've seen from Compass is the uh, reduction in uh, readmission rates. We started with 14% in, in August of 2016 when it started. From August to December, we went down to 4%. And from January to June of this year, we've been down to 2%. So since implementing it, we've definitely seen a uh, reduction in uh, readmissions. We wanted to, we're gonna show a video of a patient um, named Susan Rhodes. She's a 53-year-old woman with no significant cardiovascular uh, risk factors or history. Her uh, Past medical history was really significant for uh, chronic back pain. She had an examination, found to have uh, scoliosis, and had uh, back surgery in, in late September um, of last year. During the uh, experience of the surgery, perioperatively, she was experiencing some symptoms that, in hindsight, very likely were TIAs, but uh, they were. she was told that it was likely just the uh, anesthesia and that it would go away and it did um, but then in December uh, December 16th she had a um, uh, she was having dinner with her family at night and um, ended up uh, saying she felt unwell went to sleep woke up the next day December 17th and presented to our emergency department with expressive aphasia MRI showed a um, uh, left bridal stroke in the uh, territory of the uh, terminal branches of the middle cerebral artery. Um, she was admitted and, and uh, had further testing. Echo with bubble study showed a possible small PFO and, um, and she was discharged on December 19th on Xarelto, aspirin, and uh, statin therapy and uh, follow up with cardiology and neurology. I saw her two days later in neurology clinic, um, and really almost all she needed was speech therapy for her aphasia. Uh, she didn't need physical therapy or, or occupational therapy. So we set that up for her, and her follow-up with cardiology didn't happen until January 4th of this year, and she was scheduled for a transesophageal uh, echo, and that happened in February, and it confirmed her PFO. Um, Cardiologist at the time said we uh, he wanted her on Xarelto forever. Really, that was his recommendation. She was not not excited about that, so she uh, sought second opinion. Got the second opinion uh, in March. Got a second opinion in March, and um, he recommended closure. So in May, she did have successful closure of her PFO. She's no longer on Xarelto. Uh, is doing better, but she does have, she does continue to have uh, a significant uh, expressive aphasia, uh, but it's improving slowly. But but she she's got a good outlook and continues to improve. Uh, but this is her Susan Rose. Well, hi, my name is Susan, and this is my husband Terry, and this is Sarah, who's um, been instrumental my soul part of a. Uh, the care, health care for me. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my story. 
Um, I've had a stroke, obviously, which is why I, I'm, speech is a little difficult. Uh, so there's two things in life that, two events that have really changed me forever, and that would be finding Jesus and um, having a stroke. Uh, you just, people who have never had a stroke, just, they don't get it. So I'm very happy for the opportunity to talk about the stroke and what it has meant to not just for me, but really my whole family. And I think it's important to give a little background on, on what I used to be like. Um, I started working when I was 16 years old, uh, as soon as the law would let me. I <laughs> uh, went to college. Uh, I, I went to four-year college and it took me 12 years to do it, <laughs> but I, I made it. Um, during, during those 12 years, uh, I was, was married. I was blessed to have a wonderful son that I, I love very much. Uh, I was divorced. I live in a lot of different places. Um, and while I was in that last hell of Ohio, I was offered to, to uh, go into a master's degree program for, uh, from, through my employer. I graduated with magna cum laude, um, I, very high honors. Um, I've always been a very hard worker and um, studied, studied very hard. So all of this with the stroke is... Uh, it's a very big, it's a very big change. Anyway, <laughs> and forgive me, I do get emotional. That's part of the stroke. Uh, I never used to get, uh, never used to get really that emotional over nothing. But that's just part of the stroke, also. I saw a conservative spine specialist, and they took took pictures of my entire back, uh, and instead of just a localized picture from the chiropractor. And what we discovered is that I have a large 42 degree um, spinal curva curvature. Um, so all these years I just thought I had a crappy back and uh, really what it, what it is is I have scoliosis. Um, so being one to be conservative, they did physical therapy for many months. I also uh, did Pilates uh, for eight to nine months and just trying to do anything to strengthen my core and my back uh, and I was strengthened. However, the pain continued to get uh, worse. Um, and you had trouble sleeping. And oh, that's right. So instead of um, just seeing the conservative doctor, uh, he basically referred me to, to a surgeon. And the surgeon redid uh, not only the pictures, but did an MRI and look at, uh, look at all of the pictures and did say that really the only thing that was going to help me was a full spinal fu fusion. And uh, for medical people, it goes from the thoracic four to the ileum, which is my pelvis. And the, the surgery was 12 hours and two, two different days. Um, and I will say that I, I really didn't remember hardly anything the, the first week the, that they did that. Um, Terry was absolutely in, instrumental in, into all of that. Um, the doctors warned me that it was going to be a very difficult surgery. I knew that it was going to be. But really, when they, when they told me that, I, I didn't care. Um, I was in so much pain. I don't even really think I asked many questions. I, I think I basically just said, I don't care. Don't, don't even tell me about what the bad things are that could happen with this surgery. I just don't care because I could not breathe and I was in so much pain. It was just like, just hurry up and get it done. <laughs> so um, any, anyway, that's, that's kind of what happened. Uh, we'd been off that mountain for, for quite a while. Uh, surgery went really good. Um, it, it just, uh, it was a lot more pain afterwards than, than I thought it would be. Um, um, Terry said at a few points in time that I would talk nonsense. 
mm-hmm. uh, which is one of the reasons that when I I just struck, you thought I was just talking nonsense again. Yeah, it was basically. It's one of the symptoms of the stroke, you have trouble talking and that, but it happened in the hospital and when brought to the attention of the doctors and nurses, they you know, did tests and that and basically uh, didn't inform me any which way that it was a stroke. So, you know, I was, it just seemed like a relapse when uh, she had the actual stroke. And then this, we are talking now, this, uh, this is when I was in the hospital for the spine, not for the actual stroke. So. Um, that is, uh, you know, one of the things that I wanted to say to Sarah is uh, here we are in the in the hospital for the spinal surgery. Really, um, I don't think any of the doctors warned me that even I could have a stroke have stroke after when I got home or after this very large um, invasive surgery. Uh, so that's just one of the things that that I would like to put out there to the medical field is, is um, you know, we really, I'll go further in my story in a little later, but that is one of the things that could happen after a very large surgery, but I guess no one mentioned it, uh, that that was a, a possibility. Um, and that's just something that I, I hope going forward that people will well mentioned post uh, post op that uh, people will say, "Hey, look out for this." Um, anyway, I was in the hospital for for two weeks. It's kind of a long, long time. <laughs> um, things were really difficult. Um, you really learn quickly who your friends and your family are. Um, everyone was there for me. I could not have a better support system. Uh, my elderly parents were there, my sisters, my son, obviously Terry was there. And uh, really bless Terry because he went from, from I was supposed to be his caregiver uh, through all that, that he's dealing with. And here it is, uh, Terry ended up cooking all my meals. Um, he helped me dress. He helped me get to the bathroom. I couldn't get in out of. I couldn't even get out of the bed by myself. I couldn't tie my shoes. I couldn't put my clothes on. Um, I had to learn to do everything again. Oh, you had to lower your bed. Oh, that's right. Right. When I was in the hospital, still he he went home, which home is uh, probably a hundred miles away <laughs> from where I had my surgery. He actually went home and took my entire the, the bed entirely to, apart <laughs> and lowered it and handmade slats so so I could actually get in the bed um, because I couldn't the bed was tall and I could not hike myself up on the bed anymore <laughs> so that's that's what I would call love right there to re- rebuild the bed so I could get in it. Um, so anyway, um, it was three months, about three months after the surgery, I had finally ventured out into the real world, walk wearing a big brace and everything, and uh, we decided to go out with a couple of elder ladies, elderly ladies that we like, um, we wanted to go out to eat. I didn't feel very good that day. Um, it's not uncommon for me not, not to feel good as, I mean, I feel bad all the time, so who, who would know anything was wrong? Uh, we went to eat and uh, Terry drove us and uh, instead of staying to talk afterwards, I, I just didn't feel like talking or hanging out. I just didn't feel good. So Terry took me home and I packed up my food and he took me home and I, I said, I'm just going to go lay in my chair. I have a, a recliner that um, Terry got for me and I got in the recliner and that's the last thing I remember. Um, I woke up the next morning. It was really late, I think. It was fairly late. My head was pounded and um, I felt really groggy. And I couldn't talk. I um I tried to 
to, to talk. And uh, Terry, Terry brings me breakfast every day. And uh, he brought me my breakfast and he said hello. And he was in a hurry to go out and do some things outside. So he kind of um, handed me the, the breakfast and I couldn't really talk. Uh, he kind of went on with what he was doing, but yeah, I tried to talk and it was just garble junk and I, I couldn't talk and I thought well what in the world and I felt uh, kind of like drunk and tired so I just sat there for a, probably a good long while after that uh, just sat there and thought well okay if I sit here for a little bit I think I picked up a color book and some crayons and tried to do that and tried to talk again and the same thing happened and I couldn't get anything out. So finally I got my cell phone and I text my son and I tried to text I said I cannot talk and he texts me back he said mom what do you mean? I said I text back I said I literally cannot talk. It's come out in garble. So he uh, texted me back and he said go you need to go to the hospital right now so i i i tried to text terry i don't think that he was working hard outside uh, actually he was building farm beds for me i think <laughs> but anyway uh, i had to get up and i got got up and went to the front porch tried to get his attention and I don't really remember even what I was able to do to communicate. I just don't remember what I said to get your attention to tell you that I needed help. Well, your book, your speech was garbled, and that, uh, and we just, you know, we just communicate the way we communicate, and <laughs> it's just kind of odd. But anyway, if we just, you know packed up and just went to the hospital, yeah, went to I, the emergency room. I don't remember if I showed him the phone or what, it's kind of a blur how all that, how, how all that went down, but anyway, we got, we got to the hospital, um, my, my son of course raced from Davidson down here, he got, I couldn't believe how fast he got there, <laughs> but, but anyway, um, so I got into the hospital, uh, I'll walk in by myself, uh, Terry dropped me off in the emergency room and uh, um, I basically tried to tell the man I couldn't talk and I, they put me on a, on a stretcher. Um, the place was full, there were no e open ER rooms so I kind of let like, sit in a stretcher on the hall for a while. But they took my vitals and everything and it, no, it is, nobody seemed to be in a hurry because my blood pressure was fine. Um, my, they did blood test was my cholesterol was fine, my blood pressure was fine. The only thing they said was that my blood was thick. Whatever that means, that my blood was a little thick. Um, so they scanned my head. They said that that looked fine. Um, you know, this this took hours really. Um, it was like six or seven o'clock that night. We were getting hungry, so. So my son went and got us some deli plates from Walmart and we, we sat in a room eating <laughs> in the emergency room eating eat our eat our supper and then they called and put it to me, uh, admitted to me into the the hospital. Um, I was kind of surprised they admitted me because we at that point uh, nobody said the word word stroke. Um, you know, we, we didn't really know had it been diagnosed or they didn't want to say what it was. So anyway, that, that happened. Um, it was probably the next day until they did the MRI because it was a weekend. It was a Saturday. Uh, we got in there and I'm terrified of MRI, uh, that, that big thing. So... It's a little Yeah, I am uh, more than a little. <laughs> <laughs> So they were ready to have me come down, but I had to wait and get something to, yeah, calm me down some. <laughs> I needed that. <laughs> um, I mean, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. I guess the, the medicine calmed me down and helped me a lot. But uh, 
And that happened on the, and still even, it, I think it was Monday. It wasn't until Monday the doctors met with us um, to tell me what, that it really was a stroke. So within six months, I had this massive spinal surgery, um, then, uh, and the stroke, and a hole in my heart, and by, um, by March, I was, was, I had an heart surgery. <laughs> but, um, I'm getting a little ahead of, by myself, I want to tell you how Sarah helped me. Um, of course, they sent me home, and uh, Sarah gave me, um, good, really good information about a stroke and and what I should do as far as um, watching my blood pressure and what I what you eat uh, what I should eat and all of that thing and explained uh, the compass program to me and asked me permission, um, you know, to follow up with with me about the compass, and of, of course I said yes. <laughs> Any, anything that will will help me is a wonderful thing. I and think at that point, you just wanted help. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I did want help. Lots of help. <laughs> Sarah, I mean, not only did she give me information, uh, you know, just logistical information about what kind of help I can get in my house. Um, you know, all the the calls where she asked what what can she do for me. Um, she meant it. Uh, a lot of people say they're going to do something and they don't. Um, but Sarah just took it ran, and ran with, ran with it. And then, um, you know, when I didn't know, and you know what, when you have a stroke and you're trying to figure out what you should do, um, and then, and then with Terry's health problem, you know, sometimes, uh, we don't know what to do. Sarah, the, uh, the only symptom I, that I had really, unless, uh, unless I can't see my own self, uh, is I couldn't talk. I walked. My head hurt like crazy. But I didn't have paralysis. I could walk. Um, I just couldn't. I didn't know why I couldn't talk. So when, when people are evaluating, evaluating for, for stroke, it's not necessarily all of the signs, you know, it, maybe it's just one sign, maybe it's two, two signs um, that it is because I waited, I waited until one o'clock the next day. I waited one o'clock the next day to go to the, go to emergency room. And looking back, that was really bad. <laughs> that was very bad. So uh, the main reason I'm sitting here today is this. Hopefully, this makes it real. Um, real not only to program managers, but but also real to the to the doctors. Again, the, the strokes don't just happen to old, to old people. Um, and they can happen for many, many reasons, but uh, I hope that there's more awareness and that, that the symptoms could be just one thing. That it could happen to anyone. Um, I'm just very thankful and grateful that I am still alive today and that I have an opportunity to, to speak. Thank you. Hi Sarah, I written this letter to you about the Compass program, and um, I just wanted to read this letter to you to share with everyone today. Okay. Okay. I says hello, Sarah. I want to thank you for offering the Compass program to me. Uh, yes, I found the program and your follow-ups extremely helpful. You seem to have a knack of knowing when I needed help, and that's also true. <laughs> I appreciated the reminders to check my blood pressure every day and getting more accustomed to that habit. I appreciate your follow-ups concerning additional tests, specifically the throat test, so the doctor could see how big the hole in my heart is. Your involvement was critical in final getting the test schedule as the doctor offers 
said they had provided the information. However, the hospital had not yet contacted me a month later. Uh, you were able re to resolve that missing information the hospital needed. I also appreciated our discussion after the last test results were available and possible resources that would facilitate a second opinion concerning the hole in my heart. I did receive a local second opinion. That doctor was in favor of having the hole plugged and arranged a March 8th consultation with a heart surgeon in Winston. After the second opinion, I'm hopeful that the hole can be patched. With a chest in, without a chest incision, and after the patch, I will be able to safely discontinue Zarelso and begin daily baby aspirin instead. I look forward to the March 8th surgeon consultation and hope to resolve my health concern as quickly as possible by having the surgery to patch the hole. I also appreciate how you kept up with multiple physicians while I was undergoing treatment and regularly follow up to assist me in journey of healing. I hope to go back to work very soon. Pending a surgery for the heart patch surgery. Thank you for your genuine concern and assistance with issues mentioned above and any issues that I may have forgotten to mention, because I forgot a lot. Uh, both you and the Compass program have been instrumental in my healing process. And for all those who are watching, um, I just got, had my six month appointment uh, uh, post-surgical this past week, and I am no longer on Plavix. I am only on this baby aspirin now, uh, so thanks to Sarah. I uh, finished successfully six months, and I repeated the bubble test last week. Everything looks great. I could not be more happy. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. <coughs> Group hug. <laughs> Thank you for saying those kind things. So, just to touch on things that most of um, you've heard already today from the other PACs, I think, first of all, you have to find out what works for you in your hospital as far as your process. Um, for us, when we first started, we really wanted to utilize our admission and discharge order sets. So, we got with our MIS department to include, to contact me before the patient was discharged. That just helps us identify stroke and TIA patients to include in the program. Um, I get core measure emails every day, um, again, to help identify stroke and TIA patients. We educated all of our staff on the Compass program before we began um, so that everybody would be on the same page. That includes the stroke unit, the ICU, the ED, home health. We went to Yakin Valley Home Health and did that. Um, one of the most important things for us has been to include a case manager as part of our team. Um, she emails me on the weekend to let me know if there's been patients discharged on the weekend. She's just very instrumental. Um, she's my contact person when I don't know what resources are available or um, what we can do for patients. I also attend daily rounds, multidisciplinary rounds. Uh, home health attends our physicians. Um, again, that's just another good way to identify patients. Um, the face-to-face -face encounter with the patient is so important um, to build that relationship, that initial relationship, and to get their trust. Um, it just kind of establishes your whole process. And then you also need administrative support. Um, that's another, another big part of this. You have to have leadership support because you, um, you're going to need backup and help with the program. Um, <clears throat> to the patient encounter, so, of course, you're going to provide them with a compass folder, and I know you've already seen that. Um, I sat down on the bed with them just as Dawn did this morning, and I go over everything that's in it, uh, the blood pressure log, the, oh, everything, so that they know what they're getting. I also provide stroke education in the packet. Even though the nurses on the floor um, give them all that information at discharge, I still I also do it. Um, I just don't think we can educate these patients enough. Um, I schedule their appointment while I'm sitting there with them, just as Dawn said this morning. Um, I try to get it within four to six days 
Um, that way, if they do need to reschedule, we can still meet the 14-day window. Um, I always tell them when to expect a phone call from me. So, a lot of high-risk patients or patients I think may not can get their medications or things like that, I'll say, I'm going to call you tomorrow. What's the best time to call? Or I'm going to call you in two days. What's the best time to call? What time do you get up? Um, I think that also gives them some ownership to tell you what time to call. Um, and it also, you know, makes them more apt to answer the telephone. I take a face sheet with me just to confirm their telephone number and address because it can um, be wrong or, you know. And then while I'm in the room, I assess the need for home health or other community resources. So I always say, um, has the physical therapist been in to evaluate you? Have you talked to the case manager? Um, you're on a couple of new medications because I like to look at the discharge metric before I go in the room. Um, and our pharmacist is very proactive in talking to them about new medications while they're in the hospital. Um, and sometimes if they do qualify for home health, Andrew or one of his um, team members will also talk to them for us. The telephone encounter is just like the face-to-face -face encounter. Of course, face-to-face -face is gold, um, just because you build that relationship. But if you do have to do it on the telephone, you just do the same thing. Open the packet, go over everything in the packet with the patient, make sure they don't have any questions, make sure you educate them, mail the packet, um, confirm their follow-up appointment. For us, um, especially over the weekend, that's the biggest time we do the telephone uh, calls are on Monday. And I think somebody else said that too. But um, we don't have a PhD on the weekend. And our case manager, although she's awesome at telling them I'm gonna call, she doesn't schedule their appointment, so I do all of that on Monday. Um, and then again, while you're on the phone, assess the need for home health or other community resources. So the two-day call, um, like I said, I call the patient within 24 to 48 hours. A lot of times, and I think Dawn mentioned this too, I call them the next day. Um, that way, if they don't answer the phone, I have another day to call them. Um, also, I like to call them the next day just to make sure they picked up their medications, their new medicines and things like that. Um, while we're on the phone, I review their medications, ask them about stroke symptoms, which you'll get the checklist to go through um, for the new PAC sign on. Um, Compass provides all that. Um, I like to take this opportunity to reinforce stroke education, signs and symptoms of stroke, when to call 911, um, the patient's risk factors, uh, the importance of medication, compliance, and follow-up. Confirm their appointment while they're on the phone. That way you can reschedule if you need to. And remind the patient of your contact information. So I always say, I gave you a card while you were in the hospital. I gave you a refrigerator magnet while you were in the hospital. But I'm Sarah. Here's my number again. However, if you're having stroke symptoms, please do not call me. Please call 911 <laughs> because I've had that happen. Um, during the follow-up appointment, um, Bill, you can chime in if you want to, but I reinforce education while they're there. Um, everybody has their own process. While I'm in the room, I get the consent form signed just because if we get real busy and Bill goes in after me, I don't always have time to go back before they leave or um, it is a long appointment. I also remind them that I'm going to call it 30 days and it's 60 days. Um, and that you guys, or that Chapel Hill will call it 90 days with their survey. Many of these patients do want to help, they just like a reminder, because if you don't tell them, even though they get a reminder from um, Compass, they trust you because you're the one that's following them. I also remind the caregiver, like we just discussed, that um, they're also going to receive a 90 day survey because we want to know um, their input also. Uh, we then generate the e-care plan, Bill reviews that with them, um, and then some patients he schedules for um, to continue to follow if we need to. Love patients like Susan, we still see her in the office. <coughs> Helpful tips, communication is so important. Uh, the multidisciplinary team, home health, the case manager, pharmacy, um, the attending physician, the patient in the hospital, hey, is this a stroke, is this a TIA, do I need to follow this patient? Um, the neurology team, um, our clinic, has been awesome in providing um, slots so that we can put patients in, so that we can see patients when they come out of the hospital. Um, communication with home health and outpatient rehab. Um, and then of course, communication with the patient and the caregiver. Education, um, I know I've stressed that a lot, but I think that's one of the most important things is to educate the patient and the caregiver just throughout this process. You also are gonna need a backup PAC. Um, Last year, my son had the flu for a week, and then I had the flu for a week, and so we would have been out, you know, without a PAC for two weeks had Emily 
not been there to help cover for me. Um, and then support from leadership, as you see, Emily's here, she's our stroke coordinator. Andrew Tate's here, he's the director of Yakima Valley Home Health. You have to have support from your leadership for this to be successful. We've heard some really amazing stories from uh, all the high performing sites here, and I think we're gonna hear from another one. Um, and what, what do you think are the, when we go to talk to other health systems, they're about money and value proposition. So if I said to you, for Elkin, what is the value proposition to supporting the COMPASS program and the home health follow-up? What, what do you think contributes to that? To the I can take system? that one, actually. Okay. Okay. That one for so we actually um, just went through this value with COMPASS as we're transitioning to the sustainability phase and the monetary support is not going to be there. Um, we actually have had to look at this just recently because we were cutting some positions and some things were being changed in a small system. So um, the biggest thing with value for us was what is our readmissions? How are we preventing those readmissions? What is the value of preventing those readmissions? The other thing was is that it has built not only prevented the readmissions, which saved the hospital money, but it's also built home health and it's built the wellness center. So we look at that. We look at transition codes. How much money has the neurology clinic benefited um, from being able to do these transition codes because a lot of those were lost because it, their primary care might not be a huge shadow provider and if we get the transition in there then we're getting that into our system so it was really multifactorial for us what is the value of this um, the other thing is is that you know our patients just didn't really have the follow-up being a small facility we didn't have any way to to provide this every one of us has 15 jobs or more and so this model made it um, able for us to do that. And our vice president of growth actually now is looking at wanting to extend this model to other disease processes. So, so um, actually, we will follow with you because we want to get the details of this. <laughs> yes. Um, because everything is about value in terms of what was the critical point. So that's yes. a summary of the numbers you have and talking to your vice president is good. But what about also for the neurology practice and, and what, what was the value to your neurology practice? Well, and like I was saying before, early on we had difficulty trying to figure out the scheduling uh -huh. because these patients where I would usually see Eight, eight to ten patients in an afternoon I was seeing four and sometimes we didn't have the volume to uh, uh, fill up two two days so we, we switched it to just one afternoon and now that we've balanced that part of it out we don't with the transitional codes most of them go through some of them do not go through if they see if they if the patient goes to uh, primary care before they come see us their primary care will build the transitional care code and then it'll get kicked out by insurance and then we, we end up billing a uh, either a, a new patient consult or a, a level five follow-up depending on whether or not they were seen by neurology in the hospital or not. 